Is that on? Yeah. Amen. Um, that's good singing. Yeah. My goodness. Uh, I get this on my pocket here. We have some amazing talent in this church. <clears throat> so good. To, I'm going to join with my son and say how great it is to see John Bowman up here. Um, a lot of you are not really maybe familiar with him. He's a traveling minister, tremendous man of God, and pure as a driven snow. And uh, <clears throat> I love him dearly. A um, couple of good things. I've been waiting to be able to tell you this, but um, Cornerstone <clears throat> in the last week has uh, responded back to our request. And uh, I want to say, first of all, we're very grateful to Pastor Jeremy because he went to bat for us. But they're going to allow us to stay here till we finish our building. <clears throat> That's huge. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is as big a miracle as you can see right there. And uh, we're very, very grateful. Uh, we literally had nowhere else to go. And uh, I want to just publicly say how uh, appreciative we are that they would share their church with us while we are building in our new sanctuary. How many have seen some of the plans? Amazing plans. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful place that uh, we'll call home. It's only four minutes from here, so nobody can tell me I can't come to church there anymore, Pastor, because it's too far. For some of you, it's four minutes closer. For some of you, you still get to come to a great church. <clears throat> Amen. Um, also, I want you to pray with us. We're, we're having uh, some challenges on our name legally. And evidently somebody has trademarked it or something. I'm not, I don't know all the ins and outs. But I just want you to, when you go to prayer, ask God to stand in the gap for us so we don't have to mess with the name of this church. Uh, we feel strongly that God gave us this name. <clears throat> and we have to make some adjustment. We will, but um, we are regeneration. Amen. We are regening. God is renewing. He's restoring. He's revitalizing. He's doing some powerful things in the spirit. And so uh, our projection is that we are going to be in our new sanctuary in November. Uh, we're feverishly working with design teams and engineering and blueprints, and there's so much that goes involved in it, and all of the sound and the big screens that we'll have on the platform, and so much that's going to be just state-of-the-art. And so uh, we're knowing that God is going to do great things. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. We're going to read a couple of verses uh, we're going to start out of the book of Genesis chapter 2, and then we're also going to go over to the book of Mark chapter 8. Um, I'm going to, I'm preaching this message today in obedience to the Spirit of the Lord, and I'm probably going to preach myself under conviction. Um, So we'll just start, and then we'll just see what happens. If you need to come to the altar while I'm preaching, come on. <clears throat> I might meet you down there. I don't know. <laughs> Verse 7 of Genesis 2, 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. When you read this, the Bible said that man, in the beginning, he's just a form. That's all he is. God formed him. But he has the shape of a man. He looks like a man. God has formed him. But there is nothing else there. And God looks at 
this man that he has formed, that he has shaped out of the dust of the ground. <clears throat> and it says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. He was not created a living soul. He became a living soul. So the first thing that God ever put in mankind was a soul. Scripture says that evidently what was in him, there was no life in him. And when God breathed into Adam, life. You know what God breathed into Adam? Himself. That's when he said, let us make man not only in our image, not in form like we are, but in our likeness. And when God got down on the ground and put his mouth on the nose of Adam and all that was in God, God exhaled. And Adam's eyes opened and his soul came alive. So we would have to say that the soul of man is the very first deposit that God ever made in man. We would also then have to say that our soul is the sum of what God is. That so you and I today, we have in us, hallelujah, the very entity of God, the fullness of God, that we have the ability to think like God. And when God created Adam and he breathed into Adam, man's life became alive. His soul became alive. And so God made the soul of man valuable. So when you read this story of creation, the Lord creates the Garden of Eden. And he puts man in this garden. It is a protected place. It has some kind of perimeter around it. And one of the commandments that God gave Adam was, he said, this is where you and I are going to fellowship. This is where you and I are going to talk with each other and we're going to spend time together. But he also said this about the garden. He said, guard it. He used, I think King James uses the word keep, but it means guard it. Guard the place where you and I are going to be together. Because the only reason you would guard it, the only reason we put a lock on our door is because there is a potential of an enemy coming in and stealing something that is valuable to us. You don't guard something that you don't value. God told Adam, he said, there's something in this garden that the enemy wants. Keep him out. No wonder the scripture talks about the devil that he prowls. Job, he said, where have you been? He said, I've been going up and down the earth to and fro. And so every day, whether you realize it or not, there is an enemy that is walking the perimeter of your relationship with God. And he wants in. And God told Adam, and he's telling us, guard it. It's valuable. I'm trying to wrap my mind around how 
Godly colleges can shut down a sovereign move of the Lord. How do you raise up ministers and yet tell God you're not convenient? The logistics of the crowd are a problem. You're messing with our schedule, so we're going to shut it down because you mess up everything we're doing. So I just saw, somebody just showed me a video on TikTok that the Holy Ghost is moving in Yale. So God says, okay, I'll come to the Christian colleges first, but if you won't make room to me, I'm not going to stay out of them. I'll go to another college that is atheistic and liberal, and I'll let my glory move there. We better value what we have in this house because it is fragile. And we know the story. Somewhere Adam took his relationship with God for granted. Got lulled to sleep. Lost his vigilance. The enemy breaks through the parameter. And the next thing we know, he's having conversation with God's creation. And he's saying, God's wrong. Your soul won't die. you just be like God. And yet when you read the Scripture... It says, and Adam lived 930 years and died. And then Enoch lived so and so, he dies. And Seth lived so and so, he dies. The devil was wrong. The death here that God is talking about is not a physical death, it is a soul death, it's a death of fellowship. So there is nothing that you have, that you possess, that I possess, that the devil wants more and that God values more than your soul. So let's go over to the book of Mark. We will pick up there what the Scripture has to say. This message was birthed out of this particular verse being quickened to me in my prayer time. Mark chapter 8. Verse 35. Or verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul. And um, we'll just go ahead and read the other verse because it's part of what I want to preach. And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? When you go back to the narrative of Christ being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, the Scripture says that the devil comes to Jesus and he, and I don't know exactly how this unfolded. It had to have some degree been in in a spirit realm because both Jesus and the devil could come in and out of the realm of the spirit into the natural realm. But the scripture says that the devil begins to have conversation with Christ. That's how it started in the garden. He's having conversation with Eve. Be careful. When the enemy starts talking to you, that you listen for a moment before you tell him to go away. 
Because anything that he begins to tell you is going to end up negatively in your life. That's why the Bible says, give no place to the devil. And he looks at Jesus and he says, I want to show you all the kingdoms of the world. I don't know what all this entailed. It could have been in the time of, of Herod, of the temple, of the power, of the wealth. It could have been that he was showing him the kingdoms of darkness that he rules over, all of the sin that is out there. He said, I want to show you all the kingdoms of the world. He said, they're mine. He said, they have been delivered to me, and they had been. They had been delivered to him by the fall of Adam and Eve. It was a legal contractual exchange that heaven had to honor because it was done legally. It was not stolen. It was bequeathed. And he begins to show Jesus all of this stuff. And he said, it is mine to give. Be careful anytime the enemy wants to tell you he wants to give you something. It's never free. There is always going to be involved an exchange of something that you have that he wants. He looked at Christ and he said, it's not in the scriptures, but it's implied. I know why you're here. Because the scripture says, for this reason was Christ manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. I know why you're here, because you're here to recover back what the first Adam gave me. And I will give it to you without the battle, without the cross, without the blood, without the sacrifice. I'm going to give it to you. I just want one thing. I want your soul. Because he said this. I value your soul more than I value the whole world. Because he said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will do one little thing, fall down and worship me. What Christ knew was the moment I do this, I worship you. And he's trying to get Christ to think in terms of, now I don't have to go to the cross. Now I don't have to suffer. But there is nothing worth your soul. It's interesting that we put so much value on the stuff, on jobs, on money, on people, on fame, more than our soul, and yet the devil puts no value on the world. He wants your soul. And this is what the Scripture says. What does a profit a man if he gains the whole world? I was uh, with Joni Lamb at Daystar a while back, and off camera, she was relating to me the story of a man who had went to hell. And she said, what did you see? And I'll just give you an excerpt. He said, I saw Hitler in hell, and he was in a box that was on fire. And he's struggling to get out, and he is forever burning. See, that's what he did in the gas chambers. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
And I feel compelled for my own life and for yours to tell you, be careful, guard your soul. There is nothing worth going to hell over. There is nothing worth temporarily being promoted. I don't care if you win a $100 million, if you have the best home, if you have a jet, if you have world fame, if it costs you your soul, it is temporary. Guard your relationship with God. Say, Pastor, why would you preach this? Because the Bible's very plain. And it said, because in the last days, iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall grow cold. That's not the unbeliever. That's you and me. God said, before I come back, all of a sudden, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that begin to lose their love, lose their fervor for God. No wonder we are seeker-friendly of this nation. We have sold our souls for crowds and money and fame and television ministries. But what does it matter if you gain it all and you lose your soul? It also says this, that before Christ comes back, there will be a great falling away. That's not to the unbeliever. That's to you and me. See, we think, I could never backslide. Yes, you can. All the time I pray to the Lord, keep me from falling. Say, Pastor Kent, you know, you pray a lot and you're anointed and you're preaching. You can't backslide. I'm human. Just a moment, hallelujah, if I don't guard my relationship with God, I can stand on this platform and have to say I messed up and I fell. I've lost my ministry. But for the grace of God, hallelujah, put value on your soul. Why does the devil want your soul? Because it's where worship comes from. Five times, David says, bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that was in, within me. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. That my soul, hallelujah. See, that's where you fellowship with God. It's your will. It's your mind. It's your emotions. Uh, worship and relationship. A 50-year marriage doesn't just happen. It's because it's intentional that you guarded it, that you nurtured it, you watched over it. Uh, can I tell you, there is nobody in this building uh, that is exempt from messing up and falling away, uh, but we get drunk the cares of life Jesus said is one of the things that will cause people to lose out with God it's not that they fell into drugs it's not that they fell into adultery it's not that they got messed up it's just that they got caught up in the pursuit of life that they were so busy that two days went by and they still haven't prayed. And then three days went by because of conferences and meetings and overtime and, and children and dance classes and taking kids to t-ball. And then a week goes by and you think, why do I feel like this? And then a couple of weeks go by and, and you just at a moment in the car you say, I love you, Jesus, but you didn't protect it. And then the enemy comes in when you're weak and you don't realize it and he hits you up with a great temptation and you think how did I fall it's because we did not guard our souls guard your soul guard your soul guard your soul keep yourself from falling greater men than you and I have fallen Sunday. 
Hallelujah. I feel a call from God that is saying, guard your soul. Guard your soul. Hallelujah. What does it profit a man if you have a great business or you're successful or you have a PhD? You have the praise and the adulation of your peers. But if it costs you your soul, I would rather pastor 50 people and go to heaven than pastor this church and go to hell. Oh, may God as we grow, continue to be a house that values the holy presence of God, that puts preeminence on the holy presence of the Lord. God, give us men and women in this house that aren't serving you just for the name, but they're serving you because they love you. See, because you don't, we don't realize this, but once the devil gets your soul, there's nothing that you can offer him for it back that he will take. That's what the scripture says. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? First verse says, what does it profit a man if he gains the world? See, there's that exchange again. The devil will always give you what you want the most if he can get your soul. There is no price too high for the devil when it comes to your soul. He will give you the desires of your heart if he can get your soul. Because, see, it's your soul that's eternal. I know the verse says, the soul that sinneth it shall die, but that's speaking of a spiritual death, not a natural, because Adam lived 930 years after he fell into sin. So he says, what does it profit if you exchange your soul for the whole world? You know, somebody just, I saw on the news, they just anonymously, which is really smart, claimed their $1.3 billion lottery prize. But I can promise you that deep down inside, that won't ever make them happy. Because the basic needs of all human beings are the same. We all eat food. We all have the same desires. Some people just have better ways to enjoy it. But if you are not careful, the Bible says this, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Nobody backslides overnight. And, and, I, and I apologize for this message, but I, I have to preach this. Hallelujah. Because I feel in the spirit there is an assault on the church. Sunday. There is an assault. Hell wants you. <clears throat> Hell wants you more than you want some of the things in life. There is nothing more valuable than being able to have instant access into the presence of the Lord without guilt and condemnation. That all of a sudden you can just say, Lord, I just want to tell you, you're a great God and I love you. That we're not dragging something behind us where the enemy says, I got you. You can't come into his presence. I own you. No, sir. The devil does not have his hands on you and me. We are blood bought, Holy Ghost filled by the very divine presence of the Holy Ghost. Guard that. Guard it. So the Bible says this, once the exchange has taken place, and whatever the devil has offered that the person's made the exchange, 
for his, with his soul. The soul is the only currency that the devil will recognize in a business transaction. But the next verse then says this. There evidently is a change of heart because now the man wants his soul back. Why? Because he found out that what he sold his soul for ain't what he thought it was. I can't tell you how many men and women in ministry have fallen into adultery. I have yet to meet one person, whether it's in ministry or not, that's ever blew up their marriage and fell into adultery that if you ask them, are you glad you did it, they say yes. It's always with regret. It's always at some point they would do anything to go back and not do that. So the Bible says, or what can a man give in exchange? That what can a man come back to the bargaining table where he gave his soul up? Why can he come back to the bargaining table with the enemy now and say, I want to renegotiate. This is what I have to offer if you will give me my soul back. And the devil says, you don't have anything. But I'm famous. The devil says, I'm famous. But I have wealth. The devil says, I own 90% of the wealth in the world. I control it. I own all the beautiful people. I own all the talent. I own all the networks. I own all the TV stations. I own it all. You don't have anything that would make me want to give you your soul back. May God. And maybe this is not natural, but I know this. I pray a lot about it. Help me finish this course. How many times have I went to my knees and said, Lord, keep me from falling. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the glory of his presence. After the night of unbridled passion with the beautiful woman has passed, and a year has gone by, we find the same man saying, Oh, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation and take not thy presence from me. I'm not saying that you can't get back, but I'm saying this, that the devil is going to make it very difficult. Somewhere in the spirit today, there is a clarion call going forth in this message that is reaching to somebody, and you're at the bargaining table, says the Lord, and you're listening to the offers that the enemy has, and he's wanting what you think won't cost you anything is going to cost you your soul until one day, hallelujah, you find out that God is a million miles from me. Esau was born with the birthright. He didn't have to earn it. Salvation is free for you and me. He was born with the birthright, but he didn't value it. And there was an enemy in the house that only dreamed about one thing. I want the birthright of my father until Esau comes in and he's starving and he sells his soul for a bowl of beans. 
Hebrews says this, that there came a day when Esau tried to renegotiate and say, I don't like this deal. I want my soul back. I want my birthright back. And the Bible said, though he sought it carefully with tears, he couldn't find any place of repentance. This relationship that you and I have with Christ is very fragile. It's very valuable. Regardless of your status in life, regardless of what, when you die, what men say about you, whether you were financially successful or intellectually successful, does not matter. It's, did you possess your soul? Because it's here that worship comes out. Hallelujah. The beauty of just any time being able to walk into prayer and just say, I love you, Lord. I worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Worship will get you through the darkest of nights. Worship will get you through the lowest of valleys. Hallelujah. It got me through some of the darkest nights. I found that he truly was the lily of the valley. And I can tell you right now, I'd give up everything that I have before I will ever give up my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and access into the presence of God. That you and I, hallelujah, might go back from time to time and reevaluate what we have. For there is nothing hallelujah in your repertoire of possessions uh, that is more valuable uh, than access to the presence of the Lord uh, where the enemy has no dirty fingerprints uh, on your soul uh, but you are saved sanctified uh, and protected by the power and the glory of God uh, why is the enemy making a push for you and me uh, because he sees uh, that there is a great victory coming uh, in the midnight hour and it is the church church of the most high uh, that's going to push the powers of God uh, over the edge uh, into the greatest revival and harvest that man has ever seen. I love this verse. Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded or I am convinced that he is able to keep or to guard that which I have committed unto him against that day. What that verse literally means is, Paul said, I am totally convinced that when I committed my soul to my Savior, that he is able that on my dying day, when the enemy comes to take my soul as it leaves this natural body, that God will step in and say, uh-uh. I'm guarding that. You can't have that. Hallelujah. And God takes the soul that you protected while you lived. He now protects while you die. And he tells the enemy, you can't have them. You can't have them. We don't hear this kind of preaching anymore, but don't play with God. I get convicted every week about something that God will say, uh-uh, 
too close to the edge. When God speaks, say yes. When God says, don't do it, stop it. Hallelujah. As the Holy Spirit right now is speaking to you in your heart, saying make adjustments. Be quick to make those adjustments. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Because eternity will be based on what you and I sowed in this life. And when you take your last breath, eternity will be forever sealed. And God will not be impressed with the accolades that men heap upon us. He will be impressed with the value that we put on relationship with him. The devil is prowling. Every one of us on an individual basis this week, the devil wants your soul. He wants your soul. Listen, I want great reward in heaven, but if I just get through the gate, Hallelujah. Listen, if I just get through the gate, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to kiss the gold pavement and say, I made it. I'll clean toilets. Hallelujah. I'll be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Just let me get through the gate. Hallelujah. So what are you and I doing today? We're guarding our soul. What are you and I after? Hallelujah. We're telling the devil, no, because there is a business transaction that hell is trying to conduct. And every day that you get up, the enemy comes with another offer better offer. Great negotiators know this. You never play your best card at the beginning. Same thing with buying a car. You know, first time around, they're going to give you a ridiculous price. You know how to buy a good car? Be willing to walk away. The devil has to know that there is nothing that he can offer you. I want to give you one last example because anything can happen that can really throw you for a loop. We think that we're in control. We think we're strong. But we're really not. Psalms, I think it's 49, says, Only God will redeem my soul from Sheol. So, well, Pastor, if there's nothing that I can give in exchange for my soul, how do you get back? Mercy. I'm not telling you that you can't get back. But I am telling you this, it's a lot harder to get back than it was to come the first time. Because God will make you get desperate. Better not to fall. Hallelujah. Than to mess up. And I don't know why I'm pushing this, but I'm telling you. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Better people than you and I have fallen. Not a bobo Sunday. Say, but I walk with Jesus. So did Judas. But I prayed with him in the midnight hour. So is Judas. I've seen God do some things in my life that I knew were miraculous. So did Judas. He got in the inner crowd. Hallelujah. The Bible said that Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. But he would speak plainly to his disciples. This man sat with God incarnate, ate fish with him. Jesus, hallelujah, manifested in flesh, would put his arm around Judas, and they had good times together. They fellowshiped together. But the devil knew that there was a price 
that Judas put on his soul. My wife and I have an acquaintance who had a, has an amazing, had an amazing home with great history, worth a lot of money, but not just in monetary value, but had really strong connections to the history of, of some very famous people. And people tried to buy that home. They would always say, not for sale. I wouldn't sell this. One day somebody approached him and said, I want to buy the home. He said, I wouldn't sell my home. The guy said, if you were going to sell it, what kind of price would you have put on it? He thought, you know, just to get him away, he, he just named some exorbitant price. The guy said, sold. He didn't live there anymore. He lived somewhere else. But I can just about promise you that he regrets it. Because wherever he's at, with all that extra money that's in the bank, it ain't the same as sitting in the ambience of that place, feeling the traditions of it, the view that you were in love with. Sold it because somebody paid a price that he put on it. This is what you have to say as neighbor, not for sale. What would you give Jesus up for today? Would you give him up so you could have a famous singing career and be around the world and on television? Would you give him up that we'd be worth a billion dollars and have a private jet? Would you give him up if you could have the most beautiful spouse in the world and that they were just crazy about you? But it's all temporal. It's temporary. You get old. And when you get old, some of those things don't matter anymore. You're too old to travel. Too many aches and pains to go there. Doesn't really matter if she's that beautiful anymore because you're 80 years old and you're having a hard time getting up out of the chair. Dentures are falling out. Your glasses are all steamed up. Your hearing aid, the battery's gone. Now, and it doesn't really matter anymore. But can I tell you that if you put a price on your soul, the devil will show up and say, paid in full. And he'll grab it. And then you'll wake up one day and go, Oh my God, what did I do? I'm thankful for this new building that we have. Thankful for this congregation. But don't get sidetracked. Don't lose touch with reality. Judas didn't value walking with the last Adam. It was money. And I've thought about this. If Jesus knew that Judas' weakness was money, why did he make him the treasure? Because Jesus needed him to conquer his weakness. And so he exposed him to what Jesus wanted him to conquer. Sometimes the Lord will let you come up against things and you think, God, you know this is my struggle. Why are you doing this? Because God's saying, I need you to be an overcomer. Right. Say, I can't fall. You know what the number one sin was when Jesus was arrested with those that loved him? was offense. They got offended over being identified with him. There is a spirit of offense. If you're not careful, it'll separate you. See, we, the devil is really smart. He knows our weaknesses. There's been a whole lot of people over the last several thousand years that have lived and died that 
pretty much have my same psyche, my same weakness, same as you. In a different century, a different time, but the devil knew what it took to get them. You may look different, talk a different language, have different habits, but he knows what button to push. Type A people who are very driven, who are, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're able to get things done. You got to watch it because you are very susceptible to the enemy getting your soul because you will sell out your relationship with God for success. There should be nothing that replaces the joy of relationship with Christ at all in your life. As the Bible says, it's about Judas. He went in that night and he sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. Really, it was a pittance sum. It wasn't that much. But because, see, he had been stealing out of the treasury for, a, for maybe the three years because the Bible said that the Bible called him a thief. Jesus knew he was stealing. And I think that Jesus must have times talked to him and said, son, you got a weakness here. You need to deal with it. Learn to identify your weakness, not your strengths, and turn them over to Christ. Pray about them. Sunday. Hallelujah. Bring them before the throne and say, God, this is the area that I'm weak in. This is my Achilles heel. I am committing my soul unto you. Keep me strong. Help me, Lord, to be strengthened in the power of the Lord. And he sold his soul. But when he came back and he begins to watch the unfolding of the arrest, he's watching them flog Jesus. They strip him down till he's naked and he's seeing this man that he had taken for granted being humiliated. And he begins to realize, I messed up. He came back and he took the money and he threw it down. He said, I have betrayed innocent blood. I want him to reverse it. But there was nothing that he had that he could give in exchange for his soul. And that night, he walked away from the negotiating table with the devil without his soul. And the Bible said he went out and he hung himself. What a horrible ending for somebody who had walked with Christ. May you and I never become a trophy on the hallways of hell. Do you know how many great preachers wound up backslidden over the last century because they fell somewhere? May this church be a holy church. Hallelujah. I'm not asking you to come to Saturday morning prayer because we need numbers, because we already got them. I'm asking you to come because it will strengthen your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not asking you every quarter not to eat for three days because we want to say our church fast. No, sir. We're saying guard your soul. Guard your soul. Guard your soul. Hallelujah. I'm not telling you to pray every day because you need to learn discipline. I'm saying pray every day because you need to guard your soul because hell wants you 
uh, and we say no, 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 uh, that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, may the enemy uh, never walk away from the table saying, I won, uh, but may you frustrate the devil today uh, and declare, not for sale, uh, not for sale. Uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Stand with me. My greatest fear that I see in the church today is the enemy is lulling us to sleep. The Bible says this, that Delilah made Samson go to sleep in her lap. And when he woke up, he did not know that the Spirit of God had left him. Sunday. He did not know. And the enemy came in and began to shave his head, put out his eyes, turned him into an animal to grind at a mill because he did not know. I'm saying by the Spirit of the Lord, I hear this in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Guard, guard your relationship with God. Be vigilant. Hallelujah. Be vigilant. Be vigilant. Be vigilant. If you got things in your life that you're playing with, uh, stop playing with them. Hallelujah. If you're lackadaisical with the Lord, uh, get serious with God. Uh, if you just approach the Lord when you have a need uh, or you're only crisis driven, change it. Hallelujah. To your passion driven uh, by the Holy Ghost. Uh, because at the end of the day, when the trumpet sounds, uh, you and you alone will stand and look God in the eyes. God will not say, what were your accomplishments? He will want to say, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. What shall a man offer to the devil to get his soul back when the devil has already said I'll give up the whole world to Jesus for your one soul there is nothing that you can offer the enemy if he ever gets your soul that he'll give it back then it's only about the mercy of God that God would step into defense and redeem. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me. Where are you with the Lord today? Oh, I can't see what's in your life. Your wife may not know. Your husband may not know. How are you in Jesus? How are you in Jesus? O oh, Zion is calling me to a higher place of praise. Can you hear him call? Can you hear him call? Jasmine singing this. I normally have my prayer partners, but I'm not asking you as a congregation to come. But I'm an extended an invitation. Is God calling you? The altars are open today. Come quickly. Is God calling you? Hallelujah. I feel the pull of the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This message is not to sinners. And one of the reasons I believe that God has had me preach it is because 
we are shifting into another realm in this church. We are shifting. And we need to be ready as God begins to release the glory in this house. Hallelujah. As a pastor, I've served the Lord for 30 years, 40 years, I know. But every day, you got to go back. And you got to reevaluate. So I'm going to pull on you again because I feel it in my spirit. There are some that God is calling today. Calling you. Hallelujah. Where are you? Where are you? Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. There is a pull of the Spirit of the Lord in this place. But I want to give a chance.
Yeah.